This is an Audio Wool original. This episode of Fright Day is brought to you by Spring Heel Jack Coffee. You need great coffee. Jack delivers. Visit springheeljack.coffee. Hey guys, thanks for listening. If you'd like to support us, go to patreon.com slash fright day. It is Fright Day. Oh. What? It was just a huh. Oh. I'm your host. Rash bu- is almost gone. What was it? My rash. It's almost gone. <laughs> Can you not? You're supposed to, you're supposed to be the, the the one that people find attractive. I know. But it's okay. It's attractive because I'm accessible. I, oh. Ow. What? Oh, God. Now Contact what? dermatitis. No fun at all. Oh, come on. Stop. I mean, hey, everybody. (laughs) Yeah, they love it. (laughs) It is Fright Day. I'm your host, Byron. And with some professions, it can feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders. First responders, doctors, lawyers, or maybe even determining whether or not scenes in cinema are all right to view. We'll talk about that. And acceptable levels of obscenity as we review... Prano Bailey Bonds censor. Uh, Jesus Christ. Come on. (laughs) You gotta dampen that. (laughs) That was a big chime, and I appreciate a little bit of it. I know everyone loves the chimes. They've already left their reviews talking about the chimes on uh, Apple Podcasts, but... Hold on, you fucking whiner, just a second. (sighs) God, such a baby. I'm sorry. It was a lot of chime. And Sam can't make it because he's editing more obscenity, more gore into films. Yes, that's correct. More Inappropriate. Weapons. So something happened earlier this week, and I wanted to get Kelly's genuine reaction before the news went wide. So we recorded it at a different time and location. Right, and so now he's going to paste it in. But here's the funny thing. If he hadn't mentioned it, nobody would have known that they it was would recorded hear it. differently. It sounds different, and it's playing now. Did you see they Epstein computer security software pioneer and alleged murderer John McAfee? Who is he alleged to have murdered? Uh, we'll get there. And he is apparently Q. He's not Q, that weird psycho's son. John McAfee, he was in a Spanish prison after being charged with tax evasion in the United States last year. It was like something for... Uh, you four- said he was charged with murder. Well... <laughs> He was not. Just hours after a court ruled that he would be extradited to face federal charges in the U.S., he was found hanging in his cell in Barcelona. So you don't know anything about John McAfee, though. I mean, I know McAfee software, but I don't yeah, know. like Bad who he virus was protection after it expires just keeps popping up telling you. you need well, to go it to just it. became sp- like spam, right? <sighs> yeah, like, it, it did. But in 2012, McAfee briefly vanished after fleeing his home in Belize because local police tried to question him on the death of his neighbor. He headed south because I, I imagine he was avoiding taxes and laundering money after he sold McAfee to Intel, I believe. Okay. But yeah, so he denied involvement in the death of his neighbor and fled because he said he feared for his life. He thought that he was going to be railroaded for the murder charges and treated poorly by the officials in that uh, country. Uh, he spent some time in Guatemala and then moved to Montreal and worked on a documentary about his life, which is called Gringo, The Dangerous Life of John McAfee. I'm John McAfee. I'm a guy that's uh, accused of murder and police. His man is in Guatemala. The FBI is going to be looking for him if you don't call him, sir. The FBI? When John came up with antiviral software, 90% of the people weren't even aware of viruses. By 1993, McAfee controlled 67% of the desktop antivirus market. When he first came into the country, he was very friendly. He donated a considerable amount of equipment to police. If you're giving donations to the police, are there some motives behind that? He was getting paranoid. I started to see more and more security people. 
He had guys with criminal records. Give them gone. I think he really wanted to create a culture, a mystique like Colonel Kurtz. And here he is in the heart of darkness. How many girlfriends do he have? At least five or six girls. I do have teenage girlfriends, and many at a time. He would talk about his hitmen, how he could have people hurt or killed. And he brought me two pills and a glass of orange juice. And I woke up dizzy, and he was standing over me naked. He went from zero to crazy in like two seconds. David broke into John's home and stole stuff. So Jan asked me if I could bring three guys up here, slap him up, teach him a little respect. A four parter. They may have cut him up, tears him in the mouth and the face. And then he died. John's dogs ran on the beach, <laughs> and they were really ferocious. Greg Fall had had it with those dogs and said, I'm going to poison those dogs. Mr. Fall was found dead. He had been executed. Which is on on Hulu. Um, oh, so it's already been released. Yeah. So this was a couple of years ago. How Fil was the movie? Did you watch it? I think I have, but I've also seen a 2020 or something about him. But the movie filmmaker Nadette Bernstein tries to unravel the strange behavior of John McAfee, who left his life as a software mogul to become a recluse in the jungles of Belize. If the movie about you involves the strange behavior of you. Right. Like this wasn't like an expose. This was, yeah, make a movie about how weird I am. I guess maybe the sure. intention wasn't. Maybe he was unaware of his uh, quirks. He ran for U.S. president in 2016 as a libertarian and then launched a new yeah, software product that. that he called a fucking game changer. But it clearly wasn't. Well, it was called Every Key, and it was funded on Indiegogo. Nobody liked it, John. Well, not as much as his software. You know, it's the sophomore slump, I guess. Hello there. I'm John McAfee, founder of the McAfee Antivirus Company. Since leaving the company, I've become part of bigger and better things. This is my new product, Every Key. This is my phone. I have to type a password into it a hundred times a day. But with this... I never have to type another password again. And it's not just the key to my phone or my laptop. Mother hell. This is not just the key to my online accounts, or the key to my car, or the key to my house. It's my every key. I am the man who's obsessed with security, and so is every key. Nothing is more secure. It's a thumb-sized gadget that sits in your pocket and wirelessly connects to your phone, laptop, and digital door locks. So when you approach the device or door you want to unlock, uh, it unlocks it automatically. And when you step away, it locks it. But the Q stuff, I thought this was really interesting. I actually, like right before I came up here, I saw this. Uh, reportedly just minutes after the report of his death, an image of a Q was posted on his Instagram page, a black cue with a white background. That doesn't... <laughs> yeah, so uh, from the looks of other posts, he's not the only one with access to this Instagram account. There was a, a free McAfee image that was uploaded on October 5th, the day he was arrested in Spain. See, now this just reminds me of Free Britney, because isn't there something going on with that in, right now, too? In 2019, too? after a different arrest, another post indicated that the account was being run by a social media team. Quote, we are under good information. Our dear friend John McAfee is being unlawfully detained by our dear friend slash employer who's <laughs> paying us and threatening us with our jobs. We thank we everyone don't post this. for the outpouring of support. Neither McAfee's lawyers or Instagram immediately responded to requests for comment from the Daily Beast. But this is absolutely going to cause some more Q fucking wildness. I thought we were like in the mellow zone here. I thought we were over it. Okay, so what happened to Dumpy family? Well, after the popularity of the, of the HBO docuseries Q into the storm kind of died down, so did they. Not like literally, they're not deceased. Oh, too bad. But they're... Those guys seem like bad guys uh, ron watkins is still actively posting uh, as q uh, no he uh, there was a really good interview with i can't remember his name it was on qaa he just released a book he was saying that ron is basically actively posting like q in the open he doesn't need to hide behind this anonymous thing anymore but he still gets the response that q had and he's saying things in a very similar way i don't understand he can say the stuff and he has the power of q without being q i mean q hasn't posted since like immediately after 
the election, right? It was sometime in December, I believe. I don't know. You're the one that follows that. I don't. I so, just know that I was so disgusted with him as a human being after watching oh, he's that gross. show. Yeah, yeah. In the middle of the, what was it? God and Country Patriot Roundup? Rodeo? Meeting oh, a couple, like a month ago at this point? That phrase alone just makes me want to vomit. Uh, like, I genuinely don't know what that is because I don't follow the stuff you do. But the fact that that's a thing that exists. The Forgotten Country Patriot Roundup, uh, someone posted as B in the middle of that. I don't think people need Q anymore. But this is really interesting. Maybe McAfee was either knew too much, was killed by Q, was saying he was Q. I don't really know because it, it, literally this happened like an hour ago. So maybe at the time of this actually airing, people have learned more, but uh, I'm intrigued. That's for sure. I'm disgusted. Back to now. It, it has been confirmed that he was found hanging, and before his death, he reportedly asked jail workers if he could have some time alone for a few hours. And they said, oh, sure. Well, they did, actually, because they didn't think that he was considered suicidal. Even after the pretty significant court ruling. But yeah, there was also earlier posts uh, on social media that confirmed that Okay, this... I'm sorry, but fuck your story. This Pentagon report just came out. Well, we'll talk about that on a, a episode of Behind the Screen. No, like it, it just came out right now. I know, Kelly. I'm very aware of that. I have to finish oh, this. Oh, good God. Uh, in a tweet from eight months ago, McAfee said, I am content here. I have friends. The food is good. All is well. Know that if I hang myself, a la Epstein, it was no fault of mine. Wait, and then, what? Yeah, he did. And then back in uh, 2019, he posted on Twitter again, quote, getting subtle messages from U.S. officials saying, in effect, we're coming for you, McAfee. We're going to kill yourself. And then he said, I got a tattoo today just in case. If I suicide myself, I didn't. I was whacked. Check my right arm. And then attached to that tweet Hold was... Hold on, isn't an, he like 70? Well, he's... Yes. <laughs> okay, just, just checking that. Okay. He's covered with uh, sun-damaged tattoos from the 90s and 2000s. Uh, but uh, this image was... Uh, it showed his bicep with a dollar sign and the word whacked on it at the bottom of his tweet. He also said uh, it was an announcement of whacked coin which is a cryptocurrency available only at mcafeedex.com uh, i don't know if you knew this kelly he in the past decade has been involved in crypto pump and dump schemes that's one of the reasons he was in hot water because he was mm, tricking people on twitter into investing into these random cryptocurrencies and then taking their money and running the the suicide tweets were interesting. The the Q thing, in my opinion, was nothing more than like a final fuck you shit post meant to cause chaos. So I don't know. He was a mess of a person. He was drunk, high, paranoid, and antagonistic ever since he got in trouble with the U.S. government. Do you have any questions about John? You're like completely silent and unimpressed. No, I'm just thinking about the fact that like I get that we're putting him in the same category as Epstein, but oh, he's. I mean, like, don't get me wrong. Like, murdering's bad, but compared to what Epstein did, he's like fucking Ronald McDonald. He may have killed his neighbor, Kelly. Which is Epstein. I gotta say, Epstein Epstein didn't kill anyone. I'm not minimizing the things that Epstein did. I'm saying John McAfee was a bad guy. Right. That's and that's what I just said. I said I get that murder is bad and that that is a scary, sketchy thing. But compared to Epstein, we're not even in the same universe. Well, I think he's he's nothing but a post death clout chaser. I don't think. (laughs) He's Q. Which is just weird. I don't think Q killed him. I think that he's just like an absolute sociopathic madman. What would Q's motivation be for killing him? Um, It's dumb. None of it makes any sense. At least to me. Who knows? Like, again, I still don't know the full scope of what this means. So I'm going to leave it to the Q researcher professionals and maybe we'll have an update. But... Kelly, they, did they release this full report that you're talking about? Is that is that actually... Well, I f- literally have not had the news in front of me today oh. since this morning until right now. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I think it might be a good idea to, uh, to 
talk about it on another episode, maybe behind the screams. I pulled up the okay. CNN uh, image here, and it, it does appear like Neil deGrasse Tyson weighs in on the UFO report in this sense. Which is, all he wants to do is naysay. Yeah, like, he's going to say, I love why, you, Neil, but just shut the fuck up. Why this would isn't he your be the go to? He's the guy that says that there aren't any and there never will be. So pick him to talk about it. Yeah, figure CNN sucks. New York Times headline is U.S. has no explanation for UFOs, does not rule out aliens. I oh. fucking love the New York Times. They've done some really good work in the UFO fields. Uh, speaking of work, though, Kelly, these DVD copies of Dickie Roberts' former child star are going to put themselves away. No. No. Please. No. It's time for Nobody st- ever watched that movie. It's time for Staff Picks. They say so much, but they never tell you if it's any good. his mom in it the howling horror straight ahead not a spade fan huh i love spade are you kidding me i follow him on social media wasn't he diggy roberts probably Uh. still sucked the video nasties uh 72 films deemed too obscene to enter the eyes and ears of british citizens in the 1980s wait a second you can't pick 72 movies i'm not i'm gonna narrow it down for folks who don't know in in the late 70s early 80s ease of distribution and production of film corresponded with the affordability of vhs players and cassettes causing a bit of a moral panic Uh, curious patrons could now browse explicitly violent box art and bring that gore home for a while Under the uh, Video Recordings Act of 1984, the British Board of Film Censors was renamed to the British Board of Film Classification and became responsible for the certification of both cinema and video releases. All films after September 1st, 1985 had to comply. Some lovely films were added to the nasties list, making them illegal to sell or possess. And uh, one of my favorite video nasties, Last House on the Left, Faces of Death, Straw Dogs, and Cannibal Holocaust aside, all amazing films. Those were really part of the video nasties list, huh? Yeah, yeah. If you want to take Straw Dogs, feel free. Uh, I want to talk about a a perfect summer feature called The Burning. This summer, if you're planning to go camping, don't. If you're looking forward to midnight swims, don't. And if you're thinking about being with someone where no one can see you, don't. Because this summer, a legend of terror isn't just a campfire story anymore. They say he smashed his way through the bunk room door, just a mass of flames. Cried out, I will return! I will have my revenge! on whatever he can catch right now he's out there watching waiting okay what's the burning about byron i feel like i've talked about it at some point in the show it's directed by tony malem Mm -hmm. at summer camp some teenagers pull a prank on the camp janitor cropsy But the joke goes terribly wrong, and the teens leave Cropsy for dead after setting him on fire. Wait, what? Uh Uh-huh. But no one keeps Cropsy down. A few years later, the burned and disfigured caretaker returns to camp equipped with his trusty shears, ready to unleash his... So this is the origin of that whole Cropsy thing? I don't know if it's the origin or if it was just uh, borrowed from it. It's a fun name. He was ready to unleash his particular brand of vengeance on the whole new group of teens... The murderous Cropsy stalks the campers in the woods one by one. This film frickin' rips. I'm sure you've you've probably seen the imagery. It's a a, a teen couple skinny dipping on the poster, and above them is a silhouetted man holding shears above his head. I mean, maybe, but probably not. You're not a huge... You're not a huge fan of the the early teen slasher genre stuff. I just don't love slashers, period. I I think this is better than the original Friday the 13th. I would take Cropsy over Jason. I think that might be a controversial thing to say, and it has been a couple years since I've seen The Burning, so maybe I should pump the brakes a bit. But I do love this flick. Uh, it, it's got an early Jason Alexander in it with hair, George himself. Really? Uh-huh. And Cropsy's got some really fun creative kills, and Tom Savini 
the uh, the wizard of gore himself did the makeup and gags unfortunately though and i totally forgot about this and i always seem to forget about this it was written by bob weinstein a uh, story by harvey they produced it together harvey though he is apparently blind and missing a bunch of teeth in prison so that's fun he's probably still using that walker hmm. you love to hear that but this film basically was their jumping off point into the film industry. It, soon Miramax was born and the rest is history, which is a bummer. So I will tell you to put this DVD copy of The Burning down. Go home, uh, go to thepiratebay.org and steal it off the internet. What? Why? Because it would be supporting, well, maybe it would be supporting the victims of that monster Harvey Weinstein, but... All, all the money that goes there goes to, yeah, I mean, Is that that's right? my understanding. Oh, now. buy two copies. Okay, well, I guess that's fine then. <laughs> Byron, my experience trying to find a video nasty that I wanted to talk about was a little bit more difficult than yours, because, wow. you see, I don't know that I've seen any of them. You, I guarantee you've seen Faces of Death. No, I haven't. Oh, I saw it in the theater in high school. They had a special no. presentation of it, and they gave out free barf bags. It was awesome. I have not seen it. I honestly, like, don't really care to ever see it you either. You should check it out. It's pretty good. Is it? I like it. Really? I think it's a, I, I think it it's doesn't a, seem good to me. I think it's a fun film. Night of the Demon is one that I've heard thrown out before and was thinking about maybe talking about that one as like, oh, I should watch this. But then I stumbled across what was obviously... The best titled movie on the list of video nasties. A 1975 flick directed by a guy named Miguel Iglesias Bones, who I've never heard of. Okay. Went by a few different names, but they ultimately settled on the werewolf and the yeti. The full red moon will soon shine in the sky. The demons will come out of their hiding places, and their howls will be heard in the night announcing death. My men are afraid and do not wish to go. What mysteries lie hidden in legendary Tibet? <laughs> what horrible demons terrorize men who don't think twice about risking their lives? men pray to their gods with their ritual dances against the evil spirits. The werewolf and the yeti. Oh. oh, okay. It was also known as the Curse of the Beast, also known as Night of the Howling Beast, also known as Hall of the Mountain King, traveling from civilized London scored with bagpipes for some reason, to exotic Tibet, this psychedelic, absurdly po-faced fantasy action-adventure is a veritable monster mash featuring demonic vampires, a charlatan witch, a wolfman, and an abominable snowman, the latter two having a climactic punch-up in the snow. The eighth installment in a series of films featuring Count Waldemar Dominsk or Daninsky, played by screenwriter Paul Nashi, and also the one with the greatest amount of sadism and nudity. This was successfully prosecuted under the Obscene Publications Act and has never been released in the UK. Never ever? Never ever. Well, I guess it was released in Spain, so maybe we could find some sort of bootleg copy of it and get a region well, free DVD. That's player. what I'm going to be hunting down because the video nasties just don't really do it. For, like, don't get me wrong, I like the movie we watched this week for other reasons, but I just, I don't like slashers. That, that kind of stuff doesn't scare me. I don't <sighs> enjoy it. It doesn't, like, get my adrenaline running in any fun way. It's just kind of... You don't like the, uh, th that dangerous thrill of watching something that no. may or may not be acceptable to view. No, because clearly, like, no, I get nothing out of that. No. Oh, well... None. All right. To each their own. Yeah, but honestly, how do you not want to watch The Werewolf in the Egg? I mean, it's a veritable monster mash. I don't understand how you mix in sadism and nudity with like all of this weird shit, but... It was a different time where they were just throwing in what they could to sell the flicks. People were having a good time. Oh, yeah. In Spain, you're right. It was called La Maldición de la Bestia. It's pretty great. 
So I'm gonna have to close this curtain we uh, have behind the counter where we keep all these video nasties and uh, ask you to leave the store. Hold on, we don't have to do that in the States, do we? Were they ever banned in the States? I don't believe so. I thought it was just a British thing. It is kind of just a a, a fun thing to have a weird curtain at a video store where you keep- Oh, curtains, I love curtains. Yeah, keep those, the really obscene ones. They had an adult section at your favorite childhood video store, right? That was behind a curtain? Yes, they did. Which I somehow managed to not realize until I was like 20-something. You didn't know what was going on back there? No. Oh, I wow. no, I, I mean, this that's like standard me. Yeah. Very clueless. I am not an observant person, really, ever. You're not the kind of person I would want uh, digging for objectionable content in the films that I would like to be watching. Really? You think that I would really? Because I feel like I w- I'm pretty anti censorship. There's mm. a lot of stuff that I don't want to watch, but that doesn't mean that I don't think it should be out there to watch if people want to watch it. I don't even think you would do it as a gig, though. Oh, like to watch it? Well, I have my theory about that, but I mean, I guess we should talk about the movie before I ruin it. Yeah, you're no Enid. Well, no, I'm not. I'm not fucking. Enid. We'll talk about that as we review Censor. <laughs> Hope you're enjoying your visit here this evening. Now, on with the show. Censor is a 2021 British horror film directed by Prano Bailey Bond and written by Anthony Fletcher and Prano. Set in 1985 against the backdrop of social hysteria surrounding video nasties. After viewing a strangely familiar video nasty at work, Enid, a film censor, attempts to solve the past mystery of her sister's disappearance embarking on a quest that dissolves the line between fiction and reality. Prano. I really hope I'm saying that name right. This is the first film of hers I've seen. She's a director and writer who grew up on a diet of Twin Peaks in the depths of a strange Welsh community, according to her website Okay, I'm bio. Welsh. Did you know that I'm Welsh? I didn't Welsh? know that. You say that you're everything, though. I know, but that that's like... I'm a lot Welsh. Oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to ask for those receipts. I'm going to need you to send me your 23 and me. Well, if if we can get a sponsorship, I'll do it. Okay, fine. We'll do it for the RH negative part from seven or whatever we're doing. Named a 2021 director to watch by Variety and a Screen International star of tomorrow in 2018. Her work invokes imaginative worlds fusing a dark vocabulary with eerie allure, revealing how beauty resides in strange places. A lot of buzz came to her after the release of one of her shorts, a film called Nasty, actually, in 2015. Mm. Set in 1982, 12-year-old Doug is drawn into the lurid world of VHS horror as he explores the mysterious disappearance of his father. It seems like that must have been the roots of this feature, which censor it had its world premiere at the 2021 Sundance Film Festival, January 28th of 2021, in the Midnighters section. On February 23rd, Magnolia Pictures acquired this for distribution, with plans to release it through its magnet releasing banner in theaters uh, starting June 11th, 2021, and it was released a week later on VOD, June 18th. Well, so I have very little background on video nasties. Mm -hmm. As we talked about earlier, I don't know that I had seen any of them other than The Possession. And as I watched Censor, I got to thinking, like, do you remember when I said The Possession was just like the most nonsensical thing I'd ever seen? Like all these cuts and it made no sense. I didn't realize it was a video nasty. You think maybe those were actual cuts? now I'm like, oh, well, maybe that's nothing like what it was. And it just got chopped up. Yeah, I didn't even, I hadn't even considered that. Yeah. So that was kind of the only frame of reference I had for Video Nasties, other than hearing, I remember hearing rumblings that like, that was the platform from which 
Tipper Gore was drawing oh, her for the parental motivation when she went bananas with like Marilyn Manson music. She was the one that slapped that parental advisory sticker on all the CDs. Yes. Um, yes. There's there's great documentary about the video nasties called Video Nasties: Moral Panic, Censorship, and Videotape that I saw a couple years back. That if you want to learn more, it's a good resource. I don't know. Thoughts on general censorship. Why not? Let's get into it. Here's the thing. I'm very torn on this idea in general because I'm a very big fan of freedom of speech, obviously. And I think people should have a lot of freedoms to consume the media that they wish. But what I think the last two years especially has taught me is that though I do not side with Tipper Gore... I do think that the ever-decreasing average IQ of the American population Mm -hmm. results in scarier ramifications from media because, you know, a person should be responsible for their own actions, and in theory, a person shouldn't be easily manipulated by something they see in a fictional piece of art, but that unfortunately is not the way it works in our world anymore and people are really stupid and people believe really stupid things and I think it's put a really interesting crimp in the uh, weight that is placed on the makers of cinema. It shouldn't be the way it is but we've got problems. It, it, it is really hard to tell if people who do really awful things that claim to be inspired by films like you can look at james holmes and the dark knight the aurora shooter or other instances like that like if they would have done it anyway i do think in many cases they would have you know like it's 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 a it's a weird debate to get into and probably more serious than we want to go yeah let's talk <laughs> but i will say broad terms i'm not pro censorship i do yeah. think that any art that was created that inflicted real injury or pain on someone in its creation falls into a different category. This is one I didn't know. Apparently in 2003, a British man who had watched the uh, the film Queen of the Damned over a hundred times killed his best friend for uh, disparaging the film's central vampire, Akasha. Wait, are you serious? Dead serious. No way. He apparently bludgeoned his friend with a hammer before stabbing him 43. 40- Two times drinking his blood and eating parts of his skull. Okay, so question. Can you find down the road anywhere where what, what the diagnosis was after that? No, I have no idea. No interest as well. Uh, no one should care that much about Aaliyah's performance in Queen of the Damned from 2002. Oh God. Not a good film. But speaking of films, this one, Censor. We've got a, 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 a lead character. Our main focus is mm-hmm. Enid. Working as a censor in uh, the mid 80s, and she uh, has to watch some pretty terrible videos. She's very good at her job. This depiction is dangerous. Come on, Enid. No one's going to pick this up and think it's a documentary. It's so fake. For you, it might be sausages for intestines, but what if it gets into the hands of children? Exactly. Kids could be rewinding and watching those scenes over and over again. Which is exactly what new government guidelines are pointing at. Video technology More is changing guidelines. the rules. Great. Not as if we haven't got enough on our hands. How can we do our job properly if we're constantly bogged down by government bureaucracy? It's the nation's sanity they're worried about. Why don't they stop slashing social services? Okay, I get it. I would say a little too good at her job. She cares a lot about... I think she cares about a lot about her job. And I think as the movie progresses, it becomes a little bit more disconcerting. Like, as we're introduced to her at the beginning of the movie, she just seems like a very random, boring workaholic yeah who has a bit too significant a portion of her life dedicated to her career especially given that her career is kind of a thankless one but she's kind of using her career to hide uh push away a trauma from her past which is well and i would argue that she's using her career for a completely different reason She's using her career as a venue to watch the things that she wants to watch, but without the judgment that would come with watching them. Isn't that something that kind of unveils itself a little bit as we go through the movie? Yes, it does. So. I agree. When, it was, when she was like seven, her little sister goes missing, and she is still fighting to track down her sister, even though she's well into her adulthood and her parents are ready to move on and have legally declared her dead. Food here is meant to be good. Hmm. This is a death certificate. Ready to order? 
Maybe we need another minute. Have they found something? No, Enid. We just felt. What's going on? Your dad and I have been thinking about this for a long time. It hasn't been an easy decision. Enid, I know it's difficult, but we need to find a way to let go. Let go? Try to find some sort of peace? It, dad and I aren't going to be around forever, and I don't want to grow old wishing for a happy ending that we all know might never come. So, are you deciding that she's dead? Right. Uh, another trauma for her. Yes. And it leads her to spiral a little bit into uh, another mystery and adventure, which apparently she's done a couple times. Hmm. I don't know when you are okay with me discussing this. I'm going to say probably later just, in, oh, okay. or, or I mean, in that spoilers. There's just very little like, that I can talk about until I can talk about that. No, there's like a whole movie. Everything can... centers on that for me. Like this catalyst for her going off the deep end. And, like, why it, it seems like, oh, well, it's because, you know, her parents are now abandoning hope that her sister will ever come back. And that's really traumatic for her to deal with. And I think early in the movie, that's what I believed was the case, too. But by the last third, I had a completely different idea about what was going on. Visually, this movie is, is very stylized and uh, dreamy, even. It's almost from the beginning, like an uneasy fantasy world. Her life is boring, but the colors are, are like high contrast. And it, and it almost seems like the videos that she's watching are moving into her real life, even at the beginning. Yeah. And I think that she's established as this incredibly boring and therefore reliable. She's not a narrator, but she's the person through whom we are experiencing all the events in the movie. Sure. They try to present the, the case that this is a super boring lonely woman who we have no reason not to trust everything that she's saying and i think that's what sets the movie up for being very interesting as it evolves well, yeah and the screws just start tightening after she finds out that her parents want to declare her sister who's been missing for years and years and years is legally dead and then at work uh, she finds out one day that the media has found out that her and this other coworker of hers, who's more willing to push through things that he finds entertaining, they may have inspired someone to uh, murder someone else. Because there was a movie that made it through their review that maybe shouldn't have. You two passed deranged, right? Deranged? Yes, the Marina film. We watched it a few months ago. Why? There's a, a sequence in it where a man eats someone's face. Oh, yes. Yes, 18. With extensive cuts. What's happened, Fraser? A man was arrested in Brighouse yesterday. He uh, killed his wife, then he, he tore off and ate her face. Went on to shoot his two children. Dad. It's horrific. I, I got a, a call from some journalist 15 minutes ago who was breaking the story. He's linking the killings directly to Deranged. Oh, God. So they're blaming us? Well, there's the thing. This journalist seemed to know that it was you two who passed the film. How the hell do they know that? I can't believe you two let it get past you. It's complete hysteria. It's no worse than other material we've passed. The press are going to the, town, calling him the amnesiac killer. He was being dubbed by the media the amnesiac killer because he said he didn't, uh, he didn't remember why he did it or what he did. What he did was eat the face off of, I believe it was his wife? Yeah, I think so. Which was which exactly was what had happened in this movie. Yeah, yeah. The pressure starts mounting. The Nina stuff, the amnesia killer... And this is when she becomes obsessed with a horror director who made a film called Don't Go in the Church, Frederick North. It's because the, the lead character reminds Enid of her sister, Nina, who went missing. Uh, the actions in the movie start feeling more and more like what she remembers happened right before Nina went missing. Yes. So it was almost like the director was making films inspired by her life. Yes. Which sets this Descent into Madness story into full motion. Um, you want to talk about it? Yes. 
it's time for uh, dead giveaways. <laughs> We're in a show where we spoil parts of a movie. This film, Sensor, is available now on VOD. Consider checking it out before moving forward in this review. Whew! Pulling teeth to talk about this without talking about our, our, our anti-hero, Enid, here. Okay, so here's what I think happened. She just seems like this grieving sister, right? Like this mm-hmm. super nerdy, boring, grieving sister that has never really been able to move on in her life. Yeah. And it's really sad and we feel bad for her. But as the movie continues on, I developed an entirely new theory. And I'm not saying that this is the only way you can interpret it because I think you can interpret it a lot of ways. Yeah, but very much. I real. think that really what triggered her was that she had been trying to repress the memory that she, in fact, killed her sister. One of the easiest ways to repress that is to believe that her sister is still alive. And when her parents were trying to declare her sister dead, that's that was what the trigger was. was like, sure. No, 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 no. Because she's still alive. She's still alive. Because if she's dead, then I have to think about the fact that I killed her. No, no, no. She's still alive. She's still alive. And then when that becomes more difficult, she channels that like desperation to hold on to her sister being alive so she doesn't have to confront her own issues. Well, but if, if that's the case, though, why concocting is she... the craziest story surrounding like, oh, well, that looks like she would look at this age and this director is making all these movies. I don't think it really did connect to her memory of it. I think that she had formed memories of what had happened in her life based around the stuff that she had watched yeah. because she was a crazy person and she loved watching this and she was living vicariously through it. No, that's what I'm asking. pretending is, to is be why, like why, a, if she is, you know, hold tight. Censor. If she is attempting to repress the memory of what she did to her sister, why is she watching all these horror movies? Because she is the person who wanted to kill her sister too. So that's part and watching of the these compulsion. is like uh, what she actually wants to be doing. Okay, one of the scenes where I I think I don't I thought this was really interesting and it starts like showing the cracks in her early on is when she brings the box cover to the film that she says looks like her sister. When you first see the movie, it does kind of look like her sister when she first peels the sticker off the face on the box art. And then when she slides it to her dad to look at, it was like a cannibal Holocaust type drawing of a woman's face, but it was all bloody. Like it wasn't the same thing. Right. Did you notice right. that? And yes, I did. And that's when, oh, actually this narrator isn't reliable mm-hmm. at all. She's freaking crazy. Yeah. I, I really like the subtle things. This choice is in, in that sense were really, really cool. I loved her character. I love watching A Descent into Madness where you're, you're just along for the ride with this person. Because I like her. I think she's right. great. I don't know how to pronounce her name. N-I-A-M-H Algar. She's Irish, so I don't want to dare. Oh God! You know yeah, what I'm I saying? Can't. I can't. But I thought I'll she did. A, she did too. a really great job. Also, Doug Smart, played by Michael Smiley. I love Michael Smiley. Frizz, you didn't tell me you're such a photogenic team. I tell me this, Enid. If you get bored of banning my films, I'm sure I could get you a job on the big screen. I'm not sure how much I like the idea of being raped and cut into pieces on camera. <laughs> no, but I'm. Sure, the public would love it. Okay. Yeah, One of my favorite parts of not Kill List. His death was my favorite thing ever. Yeah, and that was kind of an interesting tonal shift in this as well. When he falls backwards on one of his horror awards and it goes through his head and out of his mouth. Right, because that, that just got to be uh, absurd. But I also think that the intention of that was... That was almost like when we full transformed into this is now a video nasty. You know. Oh, sure, sure. And that was also a good a good point where Enid disassociates kind of. Thank you for the whiskey. I see myself out walking through right. what she would have said if she hadn't killed him. But she did kill him. But she did, which almost kind of confirms what you were suspecting, that she could have killed her sister and not have recalled it because yeah, she suppressed Yeah, I just think she that. really digs the killing and she just... Uh, well, who else did she kill, you think? Who knows? Yeah. I mean, there could have been way more. There could have been way more. What do you think this says about film, though? 
That was, I thought that was, we had a conversation. I think this movie was in defense of film and basically saying censorship is bullshit. There's one point near the end of the film where they say, you can hear in the background, some of her, Enid's colleagues are talking about the amnesia killer. And, oh, did you hear? Turns out he'd never even seen the movie. He didn't know anything about the movie. Yeah. That and was, a, that I was think during that's, this sort of like, you know, montage at the end of everything going wrong. Right. I think that anytime there is trauma in a society, there's a really big desire to find a reason for that trauma. The quicker you can explain it away, the more comfortable everybody feels. And I think that censorship is just often that. And that that line is is kind of just saying uh, it's not always the first thing that you think. Right. Uh, There's really horrible atrocities that happen, like the movie Queen of the Damned and the subsequent murder of that man's flatmate. I don't know. Maybe I'm completely off on this. And normally I read a bunch of articles about the movies before we talk about them. But I decided Uh for this one, I was actually just going to go in kind of cold. I very strongly believe that this is a love letter to those movies that were outcast and saying some people are just crazy and it really doesn't matter. Like those crazy people may seek out these kinds of movies and enjoy them, but it's not going to change their behaviors for better or for worse. And the absence of them is not going to change their behaviors either. Uh, The idea that somebody who is supposed to be in charge of protecting the public from these horrible, horrible things was actually committing horrible, horrible atrocities herself. And she wasn't inspired by anything. No. She was what she was. I think that it's pro-video nasty anti-censorship, I think is what the movie's getting at. I walked away from it kind of trying to walk through. We're watching a movie about how horror movies are bad but then the person who says that horror movies are bad kills someone yeah no that's multiple ones (laughs) yeah i mean that makes sense and probably killed her sister yeah and was incredibly unstable and i think the surface level interpretation which i think is also a commentary because that at the time this movie was set would have been the interpretation like oh well she just went off the deep end because she watched too many scary awful things and it just filled her mind and yeah she just broke initial take that clearly wasn't what broke her she was bananas yeah honestly the scene where she goes to the producer's house and has a very weinsteiny moment but is just having none of it impales him on a statue accidentally I mean, that was yeah i guess and maybe that's but i also just what think that that's too. part of the unreliable narrator thing yeah i think that once she found out that this guy wasn't going to give her access to quote unquote her sister she was kind of like well yeah he has no use for use to me then i mean i like the end and obviously as we're evolving towards the end it turns into one of these movies yeah like, it's very meta by the time the movie wraps up um, Even that final sequence, that might have been my visually my favorite part. After she does the awful things that she does and she's confronting her parents and other people in her life, their faces are shown like smiling with this almost like uh, like shiny, perfect. Uh, well, yeah. Did you see it was from the other uh, cover from a different movie that she oh. had seen? Yeah, it was an exact replication of it. In between this perfect world are the the screamings and horrified faces that are blinking in. Right. It was a right. real tw- it was a real visual treat. I thought that was delightful. Yeah, I thought it was really well done. I liked the acting. I love British accents. Of course. I mean, and I think it did it also reinforced that I really do not like slasher movies. Okay. But made me feel like the whole idea of both British censorship and our censorship is patently absurd. And useless. But mental health's a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Clearly, we need to be paying more attention there. I would be interested to hear somebody's take who has done a lot of research and has a stronger connection with video nasties because this feels like one of those movies that I'm almost a poser to give an, a big review of since video nasties are very teeny tiny, almost insignificant part of my video and cinema history. But from my own perspective, I thought this was a multi-layered, interesting social commentary, mental health commentary, historical commentary, really good acting, 
and the fact that it was directed by a woman also just puts a whole different perspective on it for me. Throughout at least the last 50 years, a lot of times when censorship comes to the front of discussions, it seems to be women that are leading the charge for why this is so terrible. And I think there was even a scene that touched on that where it showed Margaret Thatcher on Ah, TV. Again, I already brought up like Tipper Gore. And I think it's typically the women who you will see crying the loudest against things like this. And so I think the fact that this was directed by a woman and we have this protagonist at the center of it that evolves or devolves into an antagonist by the time the movie's over. It's it's very interesting. I think this is one that I actually would watch again because I'm sure that I will pick up on additional things and ideas and maybe messages that are trying to be delivered or messages that I'm making up and pulling out of thin air. Who knows? But I think a second watching I would get even more out of. I really liked it. Sam watched it with me. I think he enjoyed it as well. He didn't like the end, which I thought was interesting. I hmm. loved the end. I thought the way that it wrapped up full walrus going bananas was spectacular. Um, I wouldn't have changed anything about it. For all those reasons and more, I give Censor 8.3 wildly uncomfortable polyester pants. Who knows if they were comfortable or not? Oh, I know. Haven't you ever seen them at thrift stores? They're terrible. Yeah, but I don't try them on. I don't try on. Listen, we know where I stand on that. I don't wear other people's pants. The type of character that Enid is is one of my favorites in horror. Unhinged, living in a different world. And I'm glad that we did get to the dead giveaways because I agree it is definitely more fun to talk about her in that way. Otherwise, we're just talking about like an episode of The Office or Mad Men. Right, right. Yes. Uh, she she is incredible. This actress is great, Miss Algar. I love seeing Michael Smiley. I think that uh, the, the woman who played Alice Lee in those final sequences, she did a really great job of eliciting some real genuine fear. Uh, yep. And, and, and holy cow, looks very different in real life. Sophia Laporta is her name. And yeah, Enid, she's absolutely amazing as an unhinged yeah. ax murderer yeah it was it was a it was really delightful the story is simple but it also addresses some bigger topics that require a lot more thought i i really enjoyed censor i i think it was a lot of fun and for those reasons i give it 7.0 horror awards and those are our thoughts on censor which is available now on vod check it out and once you have let us know what you think uh, you can reach us on social media, Twitter, Instagram, at Fright Day. Leave a comment below this episode in the show notes at FrightDay.com or send an email, contact at FrightDay.com. We could also have a full discussion about it in our Facebook group, Facebook.com slash group slash Fright Day, or in our Discord server, Discord.FrightDay.com. Whew. And if you like our show and want to help us make it even better, grab something spooky at Shop.FrightDay.com. We got shirts pins we have that cassette tape for when your grandparents car needs to be taken somewhere to make sure the gas gets through it you know cars sit too long sometimes mm. and you gotta okay. like may, maybe hop in with with a cassette tape of kelly talking about roswell that's always a great option yes. uh, nessie stuff that's kelly's favorite we're working Aww. on that new shirt that i sent you last week it's good that'll be fun yeah can't wait for that to come out but yeah i've updated some prices uh, things could be on sale right now check it I out love sales. shop that fright day.com and we may be fueled by spring hill jack coffee but as the members of the fright day society who keep us uncensored <laughs> when you join us sorry dad when you join the fright day society at patreon.com slash fright day one another episode each week you're gonna love behind the screams especially this week because we uh we I get this, dissected lou elizondo's talk with the washington post ahead of the release of that stuff we just talked about who knows we don't we don't know what it is yet because we just hopped on the mic but uh, if you want to know our thoughts about his thoughts that's going to be up on wednesday there's also bonus episodes of Captain Kelly's Cryptids and Conspiracies, Byron's Serial Corner, The Writer's Room, Toast to Toast PM with Wine Kelly, and Cinema yes. Autopsy. We've got the first 10 episodes of the podcast, and uh, members also get early access to new products, as well as uh, members-only products, and 15% off everything at shop.frightday.com. I would like to welcome and initiate some new folks to the Friday Society. Welcome 
Jesse zero zero dash. Mm. Jesse zero zero dash. I would like you to get a job uh, rating <laughs> movies at the MPAA and, and tell the PG thirteen horrors to add more boobs and no, blood, don't please because we need them. Fine, PG thirteen's great. That's your job. Uh, Tawny H edited their pledge up to the 666 level officially a member now and that is your sister oh schmeegs i love you very much you're appreciated. such a good schmeegs oh, uh geez. just for that schmeegs your initiation oh god this one has to be good your initiation is to capture footage of flatty oh the flathead lake monster very nice yeah yeah i'd also like to welcome jill w who paid for the whole dang year. Thank you so much, Jill. 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 Incredible. What, what's Jill going to do? You know what I would like from Jill is I would like a list of three things that she would like included in the next Camp Fright Day. Because oh. I, I want to make sure that we're really on point with that. And some of these new uh, cult members, I think, need to have some we say. We call them society so members. <laughs> let's hear it, Jill. Society. What do you want? And then a couple folks uh, have entered our inner circle. Kristen H. has uh, upped her pledge. Oh. So I'd like to th- thank you so much, Kristen. Welcome to the inner circle. Any movie set that you stumble upon, get rid of the real axes. We don't need real axes in there. No. It's not good. No. doesn't result in good things. And no. Somebody should have definitely watched out for that. And Will A, also new to the inner circle. Thank you so much, Will. Will, let me think. What are you going to do for us, Will? Will, I know what I want you to do. Uh, I want you to listen to three records backwards and see if you can find any hidden ooh, messages. I like that. Thank pick you. any Stones record, pick any Doors record, and pick any Beatles record. And I want, uh, I want there's to know some more contemporary stuff I'd like you to dig into, but start with those. No, those... Those are, it was done back in the day. I don't yeah. think it's done in the new stuff. You guys are the absolute best. We are inching so close to phase three, which is, of course, a lot of stuff. But most importantly, Kelly's going to be scarring me permanently with ink and a needle. Uh, I, I have a yes, tattoo yes, gun yes. in my other room, and she's going to, on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Friday, going to be giving me a tattoo when we enter phase Nessie is real. Three. So we just need... Literally, I think it's something like 30 new people. And when I say new people, I'm not talking just society members. You could be a concerned citizen. You could be a bystander. You could just give a dollar a month. Whatever you can, that's good enough. And once we hit phase three, baby, uh, you get a, a bi-weekly Twitch stream and you get uh, top bunks at the compound. You get You get to call that. Yes. It's important. It is. It is important. It's important. Kelly. Where yes? are you going to be until next week? I'm going to be stalking a gentleman named Marion. I'm so okay. And speaking of that, one, I'm I'm, unf- I'm I'm not used to saying that we'll be back later this week as Moon June continues, where Kelly is going to be talking about some moon whistleblowers, some new folks in this story, including a guy named Marion that she is... Uh, absolutely obsessed with and hopefully we will be talking to soon yes where else are you going to be though twitter kelly friday email kelly at friday.com and digging deep into more moon june and i'm at byron mccoy on twitter and instagram byron at friday.com is my email address society members inner circle will see you on wednesday with behind the screams for everyone else friday moon june continues but until next friday I'm Byron. I'm Kelly. Keep watching those spooky flicks. Yes. And stay scared. You've been listening to an Audio Wool original produced by Byron McCoy. Theme music provided by Cemeteries. For more programs like this, visit audiowool.co.